description of why we have three gospels that are called synoptic. They cover the same material. Do they cover exactly the same material? No. Do they cover, it when, when a, a, a subject is covered, do they all say the same thing? No, they do not. Sometimes they're not even close. But they certainly harmonize. John 19 and 20 says, whether you consider the cross of Jesus to be a stake or whether you consider it to be a cross, there was a sign above Jesus Christ. Anybody know what that sign said? There was a big argument about it. Because the Jewish people wanted him to say, don't say he was the king of the Jews. We want you to say he claimed to be the king of the Jews, but he wasn't. Now take a look with, with me at John chapter 19. <clears throat> Let's see if I can get this up there now. So this morning I, I want to touch on something I did three and a half months ago before uh, my little accident. So we're basically picking up there. But I want to look at John chapter 19 and verse 17. They took Jesus, therefore, when he was out bearing his own cross to the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. So John is telling you that the word Golgotha is a Hebrew word. Where they crucified him with two other men, on one on either side, and Jesus between him. And Pilate wrote the inscription also and put it over the cross as it is written, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Look at verse 20. Therefore, this is inscription many of the Jews read, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek. Hebrew, some of your Bibles will say Aramaic. That was the language that Jewish people uh, read and wrote. The question would be, why <clears throat> did... Pilate writes that phrase in three different languages. And I want to just spend a second thinking about this. When a person was crucified, we oftentimes will focus on the individual, Jesus Christ, how painful it was, and certainly that's true. Crucifixion was designed to be a humiliation. It was a public display of somebody that, that was the worst of the worst of the worst. We still have in Texas, and I think in 24 states, the death penalty. When a person is put to death, what does that basically tell you? Uh, if our penal system is correct, and I don't know, I don't want to weigh in on that, but what does that tell you? He's the worst of the worst, or she is. They're incorrigible. They were not, nobody was able to rehabilitate them. So my question is, so when they go out to a hill outside the city, very prominent hill, very high, and they make this cross <clears throat> high enough that you can see it from all different directions. Why did they put, write that in three different languages? And the question, the answer is, that was the three common languages of the New Testament period of time. When you take a look at the Gospels, you see exactly this. We have the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew was a Jew, and he was writing to Jewish people. Matthew basically starts his book with the lineage of Jesus Christ. In the book of Matthew, there are 77 references to the Old Testament. 77, 50 direct quotes, 27 uh, places where a passage is alluded to. Why do you think that Matthew... First off, he began with his uh, with the lineage of Jesus Christ from Abraham all the way to Jesus. There were 14 generations, he says, before uh, the David, 14 from David to uh, the Babylonian captivity, and 14 generations, and he lists all 42. So why did Matthew do that? He then begins with the story of Jesus Christ, but he uses 77 uh, passages in the Old Testament. What kind of people, if you had Hebrew-speaking people, and you had Greek-speaking people, and you had Roman-speaking people, 
What kind of those people would have studied the Old Testament and their parents before them and their parents before them and their parents before them? What kind of people? Jew. Jewish people. He's writing to Jewish people. Mark, on the other hand, was a young man, I believe, when Jesus was born, and he is a Jew. <clears throat> he very much writes to Roman people. I want to spend just a minute on that. Luke was a Gentile. He was the only Gentile writer, not only in the New Testament, but in the entire Bible. So there are roughly 40 uh, writers of the Bible, and he was the only non-Jewish person, and he was writing largely to Greek people. So what you see in John chapter 19 and verse 20, why did they put three different, write this in three different languages? It was the common languages of the day. Why do we have three Gospels covering largely the same material? Because they were written to very different people. And I'm going to give you, as we go through this, examples of what I'm talking about. So taking a look at this, this is just understand. 1 Corinthians 15, chapter three, verses 3 through 5. What is a gospel? We have the gospel, which is the system of all 27 books, but we have four books called the gospel about the life of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. The superscription, I think we've covered that in some detail. Look with me at Matthew for just a moment. Now, some of you have seen this. Uh, don't tell me if you haven't, because that's not good for your memory. Because you did see this three months ago. Matthew was called Levi. In fact, if you were to look in Luke chapter 5 and verse 27 through 30, <coughs> Luke calls him Levi. Well, Matthew was a name that was a Jewish name. But what I would say to you is there's a story here told in Luke where after Matthew becomes an apostle, he throws this huge party. He's a pretty wealthy man. He throws this huge party. And do you know who he invited to his party? There was one kind of people he invited to his party, tax collectors. A huge number, a crowd of tax collectors. Well, how do you think that made the Jewish people feel? What did they think about tax collectors? They hated them. So we have two prominent tax collectors in the New Testament. One of them was a little bitty guy. Anybody know what his name was? Yes. Climbed up in a tree, Zacchaeus, and Matthew being the other. So what you see here is in Matthew, basically, <clears throat> this is where I talked about just a moment ago. There are 50 direct Old Testament quotes and 27 indirect allusions or quotes used. It was important that the Jews knew that Jesus was the Messiah that was about to reign. That's what, G what Mark uh, Matthew was trying to do, and that is, I'm going to go back and show you what you have been studying in Isaiah and the book of Psalms and the book of Ezekiel and Jeremiah for 15 generations. I'm going to show you in living color what that was all about. And that's what the Gospel of Matthew largely deals with. He indicates that Gentiles had an appointed place in the kingdom, and we talked about that. So then we looked at Mark. Now, just to go over very quickly, Mark had a mother, like all of us do. Her name was Mary. They would oftentimes, the common meeting place for the, uh, the Christian people was in the upstairs room of a woman named Mary. You see this over and over again. i just give you one example. In uh, Acts chapter 12 and verse 12 is when Peter, in the middle of the night, gets out of prison. The prison door is thrown open and he comes walking out. And the first place he goes is to the house of John Mark, mother, Mary, because that was commonly where they met in the upper room. <clears throat> you can see in Mark chapter 14 and verse 51, Mark was very close to Peter. Peter in this text calls him my son. Mark, John Mark, my son. He also was very close to the apostle Paul because in the last letter that Paul wrote, 2 Timothy 4, there is one person he wants to see before he dies. You know who that person was? John Mark. This was a young man that when he was younger, he took him on a missionary journey, and John Mark got scared. And so he abandoned them when they got back to the mainland, 
And so the next time Paul gets ready to go on a journey, you can see this at the end of Acts 14, Paul says, I'm not taking him again. Well, Barnabas was kin to him, and Barnabas wanted to take him. And he said, no way, I'm not going with that guy again. But late in his life, the Apostle Paul became very close to him. So you can see where they, they had the conversation about fighting over him. Paul wanted to take, a, a desire to take Mark to visit him in his last days. So that was certainly turned around. Only 19 Old Testament references compared to 77 in Matthew. Now based on what I've told you, why do you think that Mark uses about 20% of the Old Testament passages that Matthew does? What would be your guess? <coughs> How many Romans do you think studied the Old Testament in detail? So what I would tell you is that's not the way that, that Mark went about teaching uh, what he was going to teach. I want to show you something in Mark chapter 1. This to me is the best uh, simple data point. What is Mark dealing with? Mark is dealing with the, the miraculous power of Jesus Christ. There is a word that occurs many times, and I'm just going to use the first chapter to show you this word. In taking a look in verse um, Mark chapter 1 and verse 10, and immediately coming out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. Verse 12 says, and immediately the Spirit impelled him to go into the wilderness. In verse 18, and they immediately left their nets and followed him. In verse 20, immediately he called them and left their father Zebedee. Verse 21, they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath day. Verse 28, you see, immediately. Verse 29, immediately. Verse 30, immediately. Verse 42, immediately. Verse 43, immediately. If that's all you knew, what would you guess, what kind of approach was Mark using to teach the Romans that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the Messiah? He's going from one miraculous event to another, to another, to another, and that lays out what this book is about. He does not use, in fact, the Old Testament, because these people wouldn't, would not have been studying the Old Testament. They would have known little about it. There are specific times that he wants them to understand things that were written about Jesus beforehand, but the fact of the matter is, this was not primarily uh, what Mark used. He was writing to different people. Now, I want to turn to the book of Luke, and let's talk about an overview of the book of Luke for just a moment. First thing you ought to know is, in the entire Bible, he was the only Gentile writer. You're going to see over and over and over in the book of Luke, he's going to say things like, this was the name of a town that was seven miles from Jerusalem. He's going to talk about Jewish customs and explain Jewish customs. Why, if somebody was, if he was talking to Jewish people, would he spend so much time telling people where a city was around Jerusalem, or why, uh, why they did certain things. Why would uh, Luke oftentimes say, instead of the Sea of Galilee, he called it something else? Anybody know what Luke refers to that body of water as? Lake Gesinneret. Now, why did he use a completely different uh, name? Why did he constantly use Roman uh, terms specifically when it came to money and other things. He wasn't writing to Jewish people. He was writing to Gentile people, specifically Greeks. So taking a look at this, he, uh, he wrote two books, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And these two books constitute, even though he was the only Gentile writer, about a fourth of all of the chapters in the New Testament. You say, well, how could that be? Well, because you've got several books in the New Testament that have one chapter, right? The book of Jude would be an example. The book of Philemon would be an example. Many of the books in the New Testament have four chapters or five chapters. Philippians has four. Galatians has six. Uh, 
So when you find books that have 24 chapters and uh, 20, uh, 20 plus chapters, so Luke wrote, when it comes to chapters, about a fourth of all the New Testament. He was a physician, a very well-educated man. In Acts chapter 16, I want to show you something. This is just a good data point for you to know anyway, but specifically in this case. When you take a look at Acts chapter 16 and verse 10, for the first time as Luke is writing this, now he is a man that goes into intricate detail, into history, into eyewitnesses, and you're going to see that in just a moment in my text. <clears throat> but when you take a look at Acts chapter 16 and verse 10, for the first time, now he's written 10 chapters and a lot of material, but you have the pronoun we there in verse 10. <clears throat> and uh, when... <clears throat> When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, chapter, uh, verse 11. Therefore, putting out to sea from Troas, we ran straight a straight course to Samothrace. What do you think the we means in that? One important thing but that, that you need to know. He was in the group. He was part of the group. He had joined uh, the Apostle Paul. He now, for the rest of the book, you're going to see we, 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 we. <coughs> He's telling you, I joined him at this point, and I traveled with him through the, through the rest of the time. So now looking at that a little bit further, like Mark, Luke was clearly not addressing a Jewish audience. And I say that because as we begin studying here in a week's time, the book of Luke, which you're going to see over and over and over again, he is explaining Jewish customs to people. He's telling people where a particular city is or where a particular event happened. Well, if he was writing to Jewish people, do you think they wouldn't know the towns that were seven miles away from Jerusalem? <coughs> but if, in fact, this gospel had been carried to, by the end of the New Testament, the remotest parts of the world, there's a whole lot. If 95% or 98% of the people alive on earth were Gentiles, Every non-Jew was a Gentile, right? So if 98% of the world, this gospel now, 1 Thessalonians, talks about it had been broadcast to the entire world. David used another passage a, few, uh, a week or so ago. There's going to be a whole lot of Gentile people that, that didn't have a clue what was around Jerusalem or why uh, stories that are told about Jesus. Why did he do it this way? Because it was Jewish custom. So what you see is, uh, this will come up pretty quickly. Let's look in Luke chapter 4 and verse 31. I just grabbed several for, to make my point. Luke chapter 4 and verse 31. So Capernaum was a very large and very well-known city. Luke chapter 4 and verse 31. So Luke writes that he came down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath day. Do you think Jewish people that lived in Judea would have known where Capernaum was? This is like saying to you, uh, well, this is close to Dallas. Well, we don't, we live close to Houston, but do you know where Dallas is? Anybody here not know where Dallas is? So when you see in a text somebody say Capernaum was a city in Galilee, it's because he's writing to people that didn't have a clue where Capernaum was. Look a little bit further. He says this in the, the eighth chapter, the country of the Gerasenes, which is over against or next to Galilee. Emmaus, this is the road to Emmaus, Luke chapter 24, where these two men were despondent because of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and they're walking along there and Jesus appears to them and they don't know who he is for a period of time. So Luke says that Emmaus was a town, a city, seven miles from Jerusalem. Again, I ask the question, why would he write that? And the answer is, he's writing it to people that would not have had a clue what was around Jerusalem. He's writing to Gentile people that may have been throughout the world. Including us. Absolutely, absolutely. So he writes the book, when you go to Luke chapter 1, both of his letters 
So the book of Luke, as well as the book of uh, Acts, was written to a man named Theophilus. Now I'm going to... Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey. I just see a glass of water appear here. So if you were to take a wild guess, what kind of name do you think Theophilus would be? Greek. Greek. Does that make sense to you? So he's writing this book <laughs> to a Greek man, but he's writing to a much broader audience, and that is to teach them something. And I want you to look at Luke chapter 1, first four verses. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished amongst us. We've talked about that before. Canonicity. How, did, uh, how was it determined that the books that we have were inspired books, and there might have been a dozen more written at this time that are not here? Some of you, uh, we've had this conversation, but you have a book on the apocryphal literature, and you're going to find that there were maybe as many as four or five other people that were writing historical documents and narratives about Jesus Christ. So Luke just says a whole lot of people have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished amongst us. He was part of that. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. Look in verse 2. By looking in verse 2, do you think that Luke was an eyewitness of the events that he's going to be writing about? I asked this question several months ago. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How many of these four were apostles that they were picked by Jesus and they lived with him and they ate and drank and slept with him? Of these four, which one were apostles? Matthew and John. Okay? Of the four, this is not going to surprise you, how many of them were eyewitnesses to everything they wrote about. I'm going to tell you it was Matthew and John. Mark, I believe, was a small child. There is a, an interesting story in Mark chapter 14 where when um, the guards come to arrest Jesus and everybody flees out of the house, there is a story that Mark tells about a little boy that was naked, laying in bed, and he grabbed a bed sheet, put it around him, he ran down to see what was going on, and somebody saw him and grabbed it, and he ran away naked. Now, it has for a long time been assumed that Mark was writing about himself. Not anybody else wrote that about, uh, about uh, a little boy. So in all likelihood, he was a small child. Uh, Luke was not an eyewitness. But he tells you how he got what he got, and it's going to be laid out clearly as we begin the study of this book. In verse th uh, 3, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out to you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know, what does he say? In consecutive order, but verse 4, you might know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. So here was a Greek man who had been taught something and so he's proving, uh, trying to prove even much more thoroughly, this is what I, you've been taught about it. I want you to know the exact truth. When you start reading the book of Luke, let's take a look, uh, a look at Luke chapter 1, uh, 2 rather, Luke chapter 2. I would say because of time, let's just look at chapter 3. Chapter 3. This is going to be what you see. This man says, a lot of people were trying to write things about Jesus at this time, but I took it as my job to, to see, find eyewitnesses and have conversations with them. And write it out in exact, exact and uh, consistent order. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was the tetrarch in Galilee, and his brother Philip was the tetrarch in the regions of Interia and Trachonias, and Laodiceus was tetrarch in Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias. 
in those two verses, do you see an incredible amount of data? In my younger days, uh, being on boats, we had a thing called a Loran. The, la the Loran was, if a boat's sitting out here, and we have a tower here, and a tower here, and a tower here. What I'm looking for is the intersection, because that's where my unit is. When he tells you in intricate detail who, what year it was, what Caesar, who all the governor, governors were around here, and let me tell you what's really odd about this. Do you know how many times in the New Testament period they had two high priests simultaneously? So he tells you in this text that there were two high priests. Now do you think over the last 2,000 years if somebody wanted to pick Luke's writing apart, this would be a beautiful place to start? Because he's given you about eight different data points tying together one specific time, a particular year that happened. And what he's talking about here is you can see very quickly what was taking place. That is the story of Luke. He does not use the Old Testament. What he uses is incredible amounts of data from eyewitnesses. Go back to Luke chapter 1 in just a moment. We're going to be spending uh, probably two class periods on Luke chapter 1 coming up. But I'm going to just give you a little bit of data on this. Well, let me just touch on this for a moment. I was, uh, I was reading portions of a book last night. And this man was focusing on, and I, I think he's correct, Luke spends a tremendous amount of time on the human being, the human being Jesus Christ. And you'll see that in detail. But I want you to think about He's writing to Greek people. Socrates lived about 400 <coughs> years before Jesus Christ. His student, most famous student, was Aristotle that lived about 300 years. In the time of a man named Aesop that wrote to children's stories that were actually about the governments at that time. A man named Homer that wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. There were a huge number of very prominent Greek men that were writing, and they were writing about the humanity of man. I'm going to tell you that is a central focus in the life of, uh, in the story of Jesus Christ. He gives the most complete record before the birth of Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, here's an example. Let's go back to, uh, well, let's just touch on this for a minute. In Luke chapter 3, we have the lineage of Jesus Christ. I told you a little while ago, I had something I want to talk about, but I, yesterday evening I shoved several other things in there, so let's talk about this for a minute. Can somebody tell me, when Matthew talked about the lineage of Jesus Christ, where did he begin? What does this lineage cover? From Abraham, if you look in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, from Abraham to Jesus Christ. You know how far... Luke covers the lineage of Jesus Christ all the way to Adam. All the way to Adam. He begins in chapter 3, in verse 23. When he became his ministry, a minister, uh, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age. I said to you, it's oftentimes that we talk about Jesus was 33 or 34 years of age when he died. We talk about his ministry lasting three to four years. That comes from Luke 3.23, the only time that tells us Jesus was about how old when he began his ministry, about 30. Here's the next thing that happened. In his ministry, if you put everything together, how many Passovers did he live through? And virtually everyone will say three. So you want to know, when somebody says Jesus was about 33 years of age, or the church came into existence in A.D. 33, 34, it is these two data points that they virtually always refer to. He was about 30 years of age, and Luke looks at things in intricate detail, exact detail, and there were three Passover. So in all likelihood, his ministry was less than four years. But you can see in verse 24... 
is verse 23. He was supposedly the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, etc. And take a look in verse 38 where he finishes his discussion about the lineage of Jesus Christ. Do you want to talk about exact detail? Where does he finish in verse 38? Adam. He traces the lineage of Jesus Christ all the way back to Adam. Now that's what you want to, if you want to talk about exact details, that's about as exact as a human being can give. He spends, uh, emphasizes human traits. We're going to talk about that a little bit in our lesson. He gives prominence to the prayers of Jesus. Fifteen different prayers are recorded. That does not count the teaching that he does on prayer. I want you to look with me in chapter 11. So here's a case where in this book, he records 15 different prayers of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 11, <coughs> he has an entire chapter on how you ought to pray and what you ought to be concerned about or not. So in chapter 11, in verse 1, you can see it came about that while he was praying a certain place, after he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So he says in verse 2, when you pray, say these things or use these things. But immediately after that, in verse 5 now, he starts to elaborate on how you should pray. That's the question. Teach us how to pray like John taught his disciples. So Jesus said, I'm going to give you some basic, uh, some things that you ought to pray about. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, Father, as we forgive other people. But in verse 5, he says this. You had a friend, and he came at midnight and said, Friend, uh, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come from a long journey, and I have nothing set before him. And from the inside, he shall answer and say, Do not bother me at the door. Uh, has already been shut and my children are in bed and I cannot get up and give you anything. I, I use this example, in fact I've used it in a couple of studies, some of you uh, private studies. We live in a world where people have bedrooms and they have a little room that you can close the door. Do you think that they had bedrooms in the New Testament period of time? You better believe it was very likely one room. And these children were bedded down all over every place. And so somebody's beating on the door. And he said, I got my kids asleep. But look at what happens next. I tell you, verse 8, even though he would not get up and give him anything because he's a friend, yet because of his, what? Persistence. Persistence the fact that he kept asking. He will get up and give him anything, much as much as he needs. And I say to you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who seeks uh, finds. And to him who knocks, it shall be opened. What do you think that Jesus, so right after he tells them what we call the Lord's Prayer, what does he go into next, the very next subject? Persistence, persistence. Keep asking, keep asking. But here's the next thing in verse 11. Suppose one of you, a father, is asked by his son for a fish. He would not give him a snake, would he? <clears throat> or if any of you ask for an egg, he would not give him a scorpion. If you then, being evil or being worldly, fleshly, know how to give good things to your children, how much more shall you, uh, your heavenly Father give you to the Holy Spirit to those who ask? In this text, he's talking very simply about this. What if I'm asking for something in prayer and I'm persistently asking for something that God knows is going to be harmful to me? Does God, is God going to intentionally give me something that he knows is going to be bad for me? No. But one of the fears that we have is, all of us have is, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what I should ask for. What Jesus is teaching here in prayer is, don't worry about that. You talk to God about anything you need to talk about or want to talk about, and you use the language that you use. I talked about this not long ago. We have a number of men who come up here, and they lead beautiful, eloquent prayers. And we think that somehow in our pr private prayer life, 
We need to use those kind of light, that kind of light. You need to talk to God exactly how you would talk to your friend. In Luke chapter 18, you have the same story. Here's a widow woman who keeps going to the judge. Give me protection, give me protection, give me protection. The judge says, I don't, I don't care about God and I don't care about human beings, but because she wears me out, I'm going to give her everything that she wants. Now, so we have recorded here 15 prayers of Jesus, not counting the teaching that he did. He discusses 20 different supernatural claims. Not that he tells you a story of a miracle. He goes into detail into eyewitnesses that saw it. So he deals with it from a historical perspective. In addition to that, my time is about up, so I'm going to just touch on this very quickly. New Testament Arthur uh, argues the evidence of the Lord's virgin birth in the 26th through 20, uh, 38th chapter. That's way different than in the case of, uh, as an example, the case of Matthew where he pulls out Isaiah. Isaiah told you 750 years ago that a baby was going to be born that would be the Messiah. King David said it a thousand years ago. Luke's ha handling is completely different. He's a researcher. He's a historian. He's going to give you historical facts and data proving his case. Let me give you just one quick example. He tells you in details what the angels said about Jesus Christ. So they received something while they were out in the field, and they came immediately and talked with him. Matthew and Mark, or John, don't touch that. Prophetic words of a man named Simeon. We're going to be discussing that in a week or so. We don't even know who Simeon was, except that he received a prophetic uh, message, and he tells us what it is. And then there was a woman, an 84-year-old woman named Anna, and she also received a prophecy, and she tells everybody what that prophecy was. Luke talks about that in detail. Luke alone mentions God's interest in the Gentiles during the Old Testament. This is a story about Elijah and Elisha, and we'll discuss that. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke shows Jesus' concern flowed far beyond the Jewish people. So here was a man that was a priest and that was a Levite, and they saw this man beaten up. And what did they do? Somebody tell me that parable. Walk on the other side. They closed their eyes and walked on the other side. And here was a man, who, a publican, who was despised by all. He takes the man, cleans him up, gets him into town, leaves extra money for the innkeeper, and then he says to the innkeeper, if it costs you more than this, when I come back, I'll pay you again. Now, that basically took someone who was a Gentile and put to shame the Jewish hierarchy, both the priests and the Levites. All right, my time is up. So uh, I'm going to, on Wednesday night, talk a little bit about the Gospel of John. And um, when I finish with that, I'm going to give you copies. As many of you as want copies of my notes, I will pass them out. And this is a good thing, I think, to fold up and put in the back of your Bible because we're going to be discussing Mark and Luke together on Sunday morning. And Brother David is going to be teaching John on Wednesday night. John has 21 chapters. Uh, Luke has 24 chapters. We'll probably finish those about the same time. The Gospel of John is not a synoptic gospel. It does not cover the same material, but it covers the same period of time. The period of time, basically, of the life of Jesus Christ and the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. So I want you to, we'll be discussing those simultaneously about the same periods of time, roughly. All right, any comments or questions before we close? All right, so Wednesday night, yeah. you can... Yes, sir. Last night, you made a lot of good things. That's why the point you made. I thought about that how many times that we've got Christians that not willing to help another Christian. Yeah. Quick. Yeah. But how many times human beings that were also created in the image of mm -hmm. Lord, yeah. our Lord and God. Yeah. But we can we can't have the feeling for them. That God, that I think God expects of us, and the man just showed me with a good example. And I'm going to tell you, Luke spends a lot of time on that exact subject. That exact subject. All right. So, Lord willing, we will take a look at the book of John on Wednesday night, and then we will move into the study of the gospel.